Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So it's important to note, I think Spurgeon and a couple other people really highlighted in this first verse that there's a, that he is the half brother of Jesus and he's calling himself a slave of Jesus here. This is the word doulos, the Greek word doulos, it's the general word for slave. He was, he's literally calling himself a slave of Jesus. And, and that's, it's just a, it's, a, it's something that stands out to us. It's a reminder to us, um, you know, at various times in, in, in my lifetime, it's become somewhat popular for people like Jesus is my homeboy, that sort of thing. And for um, us to almost lower Jesus sometimes in the way that, yes, he calls us friend um, and he, he, he loves us and, he, and in some ways he relates to us that way. But some of the ways that we can depict that um, can almost lower Jesus in our mindset and, and in the way that we, we talk about him. And it's, it, I think it's worth noting that this is most likely the half-brother of Jesus. Um, and he's here calling himself a slave of his brother. Now, you guys know um, the scriptures are clear that, that while Jesus was alive, his brothers um, didn't really believe in him. And so James and... Uh, the, the half brother, the other half brother, James, wrote the book of James. Um, they both came to faith after the resurrection, apparently. So Jude, a bond servant, um, doulos in the King James, it's slave um, or servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. To those who are called, sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. So he's he's. It's again, scholars are really clear on this. Everybody pretty much agrees that he's writing directly to the church. He was he, some people for reasons that I don't totally agree with, and I or I maybe it's not that I don't totally agree with. I just don't think there's a lot of basis for it um, to make the argument. Some people believe he was writing to the same churches that Peter was writing to. No one's. I don't think there's a good a great case for that. Um, but he was writing to the church, and as, as if. It's not enough to say to the church. He actually like defines it by three statements here. He says, those who are called, sanctified, and preserved. So let's just be really clear. He's writing to the church. To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. That's a really, really, really clear um, definition of the fact that he's writing to the church. He's writing to believers. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, this is not rocket science. It's really clear. He wanted to write to these people, um, and he was just going to write to them about their salvation in Christ. But apparently something came up in the meantime, and maybe some heresy arose, some wind of doctrine moved through the church, um, maybe he just had an encounter with a handful of people that it's going to become clear as we read the book of Jude, that maybe he had been in a church with ministering alongside with for a number of years. And then he suddenly something happened and he saw these people for what they were, that these people were not the real deal, because that's what the book is about. The book is about people. It's about contending for the faith. The, the most general consensus is that the book is about contending for the faith because as always seems to happen with the church is you get people creeping into the church when they see maybe the opportunity for advancement, the opportunity for position, the opportunity for glory, the opportunity for whatever people who have some people unintentionally, some people intentionally are lying and just trying to get their way in. But he is writing to contend for the faith because and, and I personally think it's because he probably had an experience of this or he heard about this in the church church or churches he was writing to um, that so I'm just trying to explain my, my thought process here like the Judaizers that followed Paul around right they all preached the same thing they all preached legalism correct and so it was really clear Paul seems like he had to deal with that in every epistle he wrote practically to every church, not everyone. He didn't deal with it in like Thessalonians. But in almost all of the epistles, he had to deal with the Judaizers that followed him around and started preaching works. The thing about Jude, though, is Jude's kind of writing in a scenario like that, but he's not calling out, 
he's actually not calling out legalism almost at all. It comes up, it's one small issue in this, but he's calling out a manifold of, of list of problems. He's calling out um, licentiousness. He's calling out legalism. He's calling out greed. He's calling out grumbling. He's calling out murmuring. And so it's not, as I've been reading it and kind of meditating on it, it's not, um, some, I guess what I'm trying to say is some people say that he was writing because of one event or one particular doctrine or heresy. And I don't get that when I read the book. As you guys will see, I'm, I want to go through the whole book in one sitting because I think well, obviously that was what is intended. But the book is one of those books that it's like one concept that's, enca that's encapsulated in the whole book. And um, so that being said, uh, I found it necessary, necessary because something happened, to write to you, exhorting you, exhort means to call alongside, to contend earnestly for the faith. Now contend is the word um, epa agonizomai, agonizomai. Um, it's the, the Greek word epi, you guys probably are familiar with that word. We, it's, a, it's an important word when you study the Holy Spirit. It can mean upon as it does there. Here though, in this situation as a, as a prefix, it means for, and agonizomai is, is you obviously where we get our word for agony or agonize, um, but it was the word that was used for wrestling in particular. And so this idea of contending for the faith, um, wrestling for the faith. Now, um, I don't remember who it was I was reading, what, what particular person, it might've been David Guzik. Um, they made a really good point about the fact that in the Greek, it's really clear here when it says the faith. And, and it doesn't always say that in all of the places, but here it needs to be understood that Jude is really talking about the superstructure, the word of God and the super, the, the godly superstructure of Christianity. He's not talking about your particular faith as part of that, um, which is fine, but it has relevance today because we, we live in a day and age where, um, a lot of things now fall under this really shady um, uh, phrase or couple words where when someone says, my faith, I have my faith. And I don't know if you guys have encountered that, but dude, that can mean practically anything now. I mean, that can mean like, like if you, if you were to challenge somebody on that, be like, okay, you said, well, I have my faith. What do you actually mean by that? Most people in America probably mean, uh, I grew up somewhat Christian. I've gone to church and there were studies on this and that seems to be the general idea, at least the biggest portion of people is that they consider themselves some form of Christian. They probably haven't been to church in 10 or 15 years um, and they believe that they're better off not going to church, but they have their faith and their faith is good for them and it's, and it's going to get them by. But it, it can mean anything. It can mean you can have somebody that has a completely unbiblical lifestyle, like horribly unbiblical lifestyle, and they'll say, oh yeah, I have, you know, I have my faith, you know, I've got, and my faith sustains me. And, and it, it's incredible because he's talking here, let's be really clear, he's talking about contending for the faith, wrestling for the faith. Now we know from Ephesians that we do not, though it's tempting, as he's about to start talking about these false teachers and these people who have crept in, it's tempting at first glance to think that he's talking about agonizing with people. And there, and let me make, there is a time to correct people. There is a time to, to deal with doctrinal issues and to hash those things out. But Ephesians is really clear that we don't agonize. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We, we wrestle against principalities and powers and darkness and the, in all of that. So if you're not careful, you can kind of walk away from this though, without the greater context of scripture thinking, oh yeah, we really need to be arguing more for, for, and, and I, I don't know that that's really the heart. It doesn't go there. And, and I think it's important just to kind of clarify that. So to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now this, this is a really important statement here where he says was once for all delivered to the saints. This is something that, that, that should be said to any Mormon that knocks on your door, Jehovah's Witness, that the faith, the faith was once for all delivered. It's already been delivered. It's all here. It's not further. There's no more revelation um, that, that we're awaiting or that we should expect because the New Testament makes it really clear. Um, Hebrews also says very much the same thing when it says, you know, um, that, that he has 
now spoken to us in the Son, and there is nothing else that he has to say um, that we don't already have. So, was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, just a little comment here because this, this broaches on a, on a Calvinist issue which someone else brought up recently. And I just want to, I want to deal briefly with this. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. So the condemnation that Jude really, it's all, it's a lot of hellfire and brimstone. He's talking about hell. He's talking about eternal damnation. And one of the people that I read um, basically was talking about, oh, these people are destined for this destruction. And it does say that, but I want to make this really clear because this this is where a lot of people get tripped up, and rightfully so with Calvinism, because Calvinism is wrong on this issue. Um, it is true that the ungodly false teachers are destined for destruction. But I want to make this really clear. It is not mean that Joe is destined for destruction. It means if Joe becomes an ungodly, stubborn, unrepentant, false teacher that he has become that which is destined for destruction. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm actually talking about the set, the group, not the individual because there's a huge difference here. And in in, search this out for yourself. And, and there is, we're probably gonna go through Romans 9 at some point in the near future because people keep requesting it. Um, but the primary thing for those of you who are maybe interested in the subject and you've maybe read Romans 9 enough to kind of be struggling through it, please note that all of the places where it talks about in this, um, in this idea of, of destiny and election and um, in people being ordained to go in a certain direction, that it is all talking about people groups not individuals. It's really clear, actually. It's talking about the, the Jews. Romans 9 starts out talking about the Jewish nation and Paul's love for the Jewish nation. And then he goes on and he's talking about Jacob and Esau and ignorant people go, oh, he's talking about individuals. No, he's not. The prophecy that he's quoting is clearly talking about Edom and Israel. It's not talking about Jacob and Esau. It's talking about Edom and Israel, the two nations. And you go down and, and as you go through it, if you do your homework and you do your research, you will find that in every situation where it's talking about something that can appear troubling, if it were talking about an individual, David is destined for destruction. That's troubling. If David has no choice and David is destined for destruction, that's troubling. But when I read this passage and it says, for certain men have crept in un unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, or to put it another way, I think in one of the versions that even says this, who, who were destined for destruction this condemnation, it's important to note that it's talking about the group. It's talking about the people who hold that ideology. It is not talking about individuals. And that makes a big, it, for me, honestly, that makes all the difference in the world. Ungodly men, notice the generic um, personal pronoun, men there, who turn the grace of God, the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is, I don't remember who it was, something I read a long time ago, but someone has appropriately called it gracism. You know, we have legalism on this end of the spectrum, but then on the other end of the spectrum, you have gracism. You have people who take the grace of God, and it's like Peter said of Paul's writings. He said, you know, there's some of the things Paul said were hard to understand, and some people twist them to their own destruction. And the idea is, it's the same idea here, that some people take grace and they read a chapter like Romans 5 or Romans 6 that's talking about how great grace is and how incredible and free it is and they don't read the next sorry Romans 5 and then they don't read 6 where it says so then grace is amazing should we continue in sin that grace may abound and this idea that there are people that take the grace of God and they remove any of the qualifications on it, any of the, the context in the scripture upon it, and they begin to teach people that, yeah, you can pretty much do whatever you want and you're good because God's gracious and he loves you and so you're cool. And so he says here, certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God 
into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it's, well, we'll move on there. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. <clears throat> and the angels, who do not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange feathers, flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So there are three examples given here, but I want to remind you this. I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. There are three examples given here. It's the Exodus, the demons, and Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're, they're, each one is pointing out something important. But this first one, the Exodus, and the people who being saved out of Egypt, many of them were later destroyed. The ones who did not believe were later destroyed. This is strongly reminiscent of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where um, the Apostle Paul talks about all of the people that came out of Egypt and, and, did, and the spiritual rock that followed them, and that was Christ, and did not all drink of that same spiritual drink, of that same spiritual rock. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. And the same idea that just because they had been saved from Egypt and they had seen God's saving hand did not mean they were okay. Now, I'm just gonna, this, we're now broaching on, on the main subject of the book of Jude, and that is, and it, it broaches this idea, can you lose your salvation? Okay, I'm probably not gonna totally answer that tonight. I, I don't think I, anybody could totally answer that because it, it's a tricky situation. And so I, I've already probably belayed the idea that um, I'm not a Calvinist, and I, I, so I don't adhere to the five points of Calvinism. Though, if I was honest with you, if Calvinism's here and, Arminian, and Arminianism is over here, I probably am a little over here, as that's kind of where Calvary falls, and I pretty much agree with all of that. Um, I think Arminianism in its core is, is in, most of Arminianism is actually heresy if you really study it. Um, where some of Calvinism is very problematic and, and troublesome. Um, so Jude basically, whether people like it or not, rubs on this issue of can you lose your salvation? Can you walk away from your salvation? Is there a difference? What's the difference? This, though, is not talking... I personally don't think this Exodus example is talking about people who are saved, okay? Now, he's... It's very important that I, that, that I want you to understand in the context of this part right here, he's writing to the church, but he's not talking to them about themselves, okay? He's talking to them about false teachers who have come in. And it's important because I, I've kind of, uh, and, and obviously, you know, study it for yourself, but what is, I believe is being said by the Exodus example here is that Jesus died for all, right? And, and the Bible makes it really clear that he died not only for us, but also for the whole world. The whole world has been, in a sense, saved from their sins. He died on the cross to save us, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And I don't uh, there's like a whole thing you would have to unpack with this, but the idea is, as John Corson point, says, and I strongly agree with him, is that there's only one sin that sends people to hell, and it's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. All other sins have been forgiven. They, Jesus literally took all of them upon himself at the cross, and all men, the cross, and all men are all forgiven all their sins because all the sins were already placed on Jesus. The issue becomes the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The issue becomes the rejection of the working of the Holy Spirit in your life and the rejection of Christ. That is the issue that sends people to hell. Now, for those of you who maybe know Christianity, maybe you've studied apologetics, you've probably come across the course, The Way of the Master. Um, I've, I love the course. I've studied the course. I agree with 98% of it. I love Ray Comfort. I appreciate him. I've used his tracks. I, I still today would use 98% of the way of the master except this one thing. Do you guys all, how many of you have heard of the way of the master? So, okay, so some of you have. So the idea 
that you go up to somebody and you say, hey, you start up a conversation and you then you basically go, hey, have you ever have you ever stolen anything? You know, and they're like, oh, nah. And you're like, well, like a pencil. Have you ever stolen a pencil? Yeah, I've stolen a pencil. Well, what does that make you? Uh, a, a thief. You know, have you ever stole a lie? I mean, have you ever told a lie? Well, I don't know. Well, you just told me a lie about the pencil, so we know you're a liar. And and it's a clever way. And admittedly, it, the idea is is absolutely spot on that if people don't know they're sinners, they don't understand why you're offering them a savior. And so the way of the master is dead on right about that, that one of the fundamental flaws of modern evangelism is that many people go out and they're trying to tell people about a savior without first even explaining what sin is. And so people are like, save me from what? I don't need, but, and then, and then convincing people, and this is the, the part that's kind of rubs raw with people. It's important. It's necessary to some degree to convince them that they're a sinner. And so that's great. But what I want to say is this, is there's an implication given by that train of thought that says, wait a second. And literally, people that I know that have used the way of the master and street witness with it and have street witness with it regularly have said numerous times, thinking people that are engaging them in the conversation then say, wait a second, you're saying God's going to send me to hell for stealing a pencil? Well, here's the interesting thought. Can God do that? Yes. Does God's holiness require that? Yes. Does God send people to hell for stealing pencils? No, he does not. This is the interesting thing. He sends people to hell for trampling the Son of God under, underfoot and counting the blood of the covenant, covenant a common thing and rejecting Jesus Christ. That is the thing that is worthy of an internal punishment and that has to be understood. That really, so I apologize. I know that wasn't well um, explained, but it's important that you understand that because th when we come to this here, <clears throat> where he says, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And I personally believe how this links, how this um, relates to us is that the truth is, is that God sent his son, his son died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. The whole world has been saved from their sins, but you still must believe in Jesus or you will be destroyed. And so J.B. Phillips, I think it was, was the one, no, it wasn't. I'm sorry. I've, I've read a handful of people and I wasn't even taking notes on some of the people. Um, but basically said, this is a, um, in our day and age, there are a lot of people that think they're saved because God loves me. Well, God loves me, right? And God's love is unconditional. And I'm not going to go off. I know that some of you guys, you've heard me talk about that before. Um, God's, whether God's love is conditional or not, I, I personally believe it is strongly conditional, though it's, a, it, that's, it's more sophisticated than that. But um, this idea... Maybe I should say experiencing God's love is conditional. He loves everyone, that's true. Um, but experiencing his love is highly conditional because you have to believe to experience his love. That's a condition. And so this idea that, um, that people have to believe. And so I, I think that makes sense. I think you guys hear what I'm saying there. Because the problem is, is that... Well, once you unpack it like that, I don't see how you could make it say anything else. I don't, I don't see how this, these, this verse right here could say anything other than Jesus died for the whole world. That, that's true. We, no one would argue with that. What people, some people don't understand, though, is that when he died for the whole world, he took the, all of the sins of the entire world upon himself, even the people who would never believe in him. He took their sins on himself, too. And that they are not going to be judged for those sins. The only sin that people are going to be judged for is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the rejecting of the work of the Holy Spirit, the hardening of your heart to the Holy Spirit drawing you to salvation. So, um, and the angels, so second, he goes on to the second, the second um, example here. The, and the angels who do not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. This is where there is, he is beginning to point the finger at the, the recipients of the letter. Because this 
if you read the letter and over and over again, and I'm, I'd have imagined you guys will because it's a really interesting letter. It's challenging. Um, it's going to engage your intellect in a serious way. Um, this one, I do believe, is beginning to point towards the church, though. And he's the implication, because it ties in so succinctly with the rest of the letter, is that we need to be careful to, to stay in our abode that God has given, to stay in the faith. And that ties in with it, what most people consider is the main, is the, 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 the coup de grace of the book is there in verse 20 where he says, keep yourselves in the love of God. This is that book where it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. This is where he's beginning to, to um, unpack that idea. And so this here, notice that it says, who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He is reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so Sodom, we see the example of the consequences of giving yourself over to aberrant um, and strange sexuality. So we're going to move on because he's just beginning this concept. Likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Now, it's important here to, to note that the Bible uses the word flesh in three ways. I think you guys probably know this. It uses it to mean your flesh, like your skin, your body, your blood vessels, your muscle. It uses it in that way. It uses it of all flesh, of all mankind, and it uses it as of the, your flesh, your fallen nature that you still have within you that wars inside of you with the spirit. And so here, I believe it's pretty clear that he's talking about your literal body, your biological flesh. Um, it doesn't make sense in either of the other two meanings to say that he's defiled the flesh as though all of mankind. It doesn't seem to make sense in the sense that he's defiling what's already defiled, your fallen nature. That doesn't make sense either. And so it seems, likewise, these, likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. <clears throat> Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So there's no account of this anywhere. Um, there's an account like it in Zechariah, but the people are different in that account. And in the comment, though it's the same, it comes. It doesn't come from Michael the Archangel. Um, Josephus, I believe, believed that God did something with the body of Moses, like secretly hid the body of Moses, so that the people um, would not commit idolatry and worship Moses's body. Uh, I don't know if there's much credit to that, but. Um, um, David Guzik basically says from that, he says, look, the, the Josephus comment seems to lead credence um, to this idea or seems to maybe dovetail into this idea that Michael the archangel um, contended with the devil about disputing about the body of Moses. But um, there are basically no one knows where this is, if it's quoted from anywhere, where Jude got this information. Maybe it was just via the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, but if it was via a book that was available at the time, it's no longer available, and we have no idea. But it does bring an interesting concept out. And I, one of my favorite Bible teachers, when he went through this verse, he said, and, and I'll never forget this, it's really wise. He said, it's really good to always keep the, the Lord between you and the devil. And, and there's a part of that here. Now, the main implication is is... is <coughs> The idea that the most regal creature that we're aware of is speaking to the most despised creature we're aware of. Michael is the archangel, the creature, a created being from the creator. Michael is seems to be the highest or right up at the highest level of God's creation, at least in regality 
and a current authority, though we will one day judge the angels. So you have this person who, at least in authority and pomp and circumstance and regality, is among the highest of God's created beings, speaking to the being that is the lowest in God's economy of rea- regality and, and worthiness of, of respect. The highest creature, in, if you're following what I'm saying, at least in terms of respect, is speaking to the lowest creature, and he did not rail him. He did not you know, insult him. He did not personally, uh, like, try to argue with him. And this is where this gets into something that's very valuable to us. You know what Eve should have done in the garden when the when the devil walked up to her and or slithered up to her and started started the temptation? She should have never engaged him intellectually. It is always a mistake to engage the devil intellectually. He is far smarter than you. And he's been doing this thousands of years. And it is so foolish to engage him. And and whether you you like it or not, I don't know where everybody is on the spectrum of being aware of spiritual warfare and being aware of fiery darts being as in the form of thoughts, fears, doubts, um, emotions, impressions being fired into your psyche, into your soul. Um, I don't know where you are on the spectrum of an awareness of that. Um, but the, the truth is, is that the biggest mistake you can make with the doubts, with the intellectual fiery darts, is to engage them and begin to argue with the creature that is sending them your way. That creature, it's probably not the actually the devil, it's a devil, um, is far more intelligent than you, has been, just by virtue of the fact that that creature has been cognizantly, actively trying to destroy human beings for thousands of years, studies it. It's like the only thing that they do. And it is foolish for us to, to think that, you know, yeah, I'm going to have this argument with the devil. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to reason my way through this doubt. No, I would really encourage you to go to the word. I would encourage you to say the Lord rebuke you. I'm not going there. I'm going to go to the word. I am not talking about not dealing with um, intellectual problems. I'm not saying that we are not, I'm not that Christian and I don't believe in a form of Christianity Christianity that doesn't acknowledge um, skepticisms and things like that and thinks that, oh, well, we don't have the, no, I've found the scripture always, it's already, already embedded in the scripture, the answer to any skeptical question that someone might have, uh, a general skeptical thing, and this idea that some people, we feel the need to wrap our head around this this thing that really is a fiery dart it's a trick you shouldn't even engage the devil it's it's kind of a lose-lose scenario it's better to say the lord rebuke you and if that thing is really troubling maybe take it to the lord and ask the lord to show you um the answer to it but engaging it and thinking the thought process and i guess what i'm trying to say is you have two types of christians you have the christian who's kind of ignorant of spiritual warfare and they're engaged in spiritual warfare whether they like it or not and they think they have a monologue going on in their mind it's really a dialogue it's your or a trialogue i believe that the 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 demonic forces um your own spirit via the holy spirit and your mind all in some way interact in your soul or on some sort of arena like that and the, the the christians that have the hardest time are the first type who just believe that there's a monologue playing in your head and it's all you. <laughs> no, it's not. It's God is speaking to you. Uh, devils are, are attacking you from time to time. And, and it's not a monologue. At, at the very least, it's very often a dialogue. So you need to understand that. Um, that being understood, though, then you have the Christians, okay, so they understand it's a dialogue, but they, we, and I speak experientially here that the early first 10, 15 years of my Christian life were very difficult. In particular, I worked a job for four and a half years after Bible college where I had, I was in my head all day long. I was doing a day job and I had headphones on and, and like literally could just think. And so like I would get all wrapped up in spiritual warfare and these arguments and these depression and fear and thoughts and all these things. And it wasn't until years later that I realized that why am I even, where did I get the impression that I needed to engage the devil in my mind? Where did I even get that impression? 
What I believe God really wants is for me to go, the Lord rebuke you. I'm going to keep Jesus between you and I, and the Lord rebuke you. I'm not going to even pretend like I'm going to rebuke you and I'm going to go toe to toe with you. The Lord rebuke you. Get out of my face. I'm going to I'm going to seek the Lord and I'm going to let the Lord speak to me and maybe lead me to the truth in in his time that deals with maybe that doubt or that that intellectual thing. That that intellectual fiery dart. The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil. So these people, these false teachers who have crept in, they are completely unlike Michael the archangel who would not even revile the devil, even though the devil is the creature that most deserves it of all creatures. He is the creature that is behind all, I mean, humans are responsible too, but he is ultimately behind all of the evil and all of the despicable things that we, on the, on the, in the big picture, he is the one behind the, human trafficking and things like that. And when you start to think of the devil as the one that's behind all of the horrors of human trafficking and, and heroin and opioids and broken marriages and abused children and all of this stuff, and you, and you begin to realize that though people are culpable, we are willing participants, and so we can't stand before God and be like, oh, the devil made me do it. But the devil is actively behind it all, though. When you think of him in that terms of how despicable and vile he is and the hurt and maliciousness and, and abomination, all of the abominations that he has, he has actively tried to push through humanity over the, the millennia, that Michael the Archangel, this person, if there is a creature that exists that is worthy of being railed on and spat on and being told how despicable they are. It's the devil. And if there's a creature that has the right to, to say it all, it would be Michael, the archangel. And he didn't even bring a reviling accusation against him. And this is interesting, guys, because this is where this kind of rubs against us. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast, and these things, they corrupt themselves. So before we go into these next three, um, but these people speaking, they reject authority and they speak evil of dignitaries. We need to be careful of that, guys. I think we need to be careful. I, I, uh, I am super guilty of getting political at times and just like railing the TV screen and be like, ah, you know, like this person is, is absolutely vile. And, and, and I think we need to be careful. In particular, though, um, where we really need to be careful, I believe that a big part of the context is in the church. People move in, false teachers move in, and one of the, the marks of false teachers is they're always disparaging other people. They're, they're speaking evil of people that they shouldn't be speaking evil of. Because what inevitably, one of the things that a false teacher is trying to do is they're trying to draw you to themselves. So they're the person that, like Absalom, comes on the scene. And what does Absalom do when he's after he's back in Jerusalem and he's now actively going to try and incite a rebellion and start a civil war and take the throne? He starts subtly speaking evil of David. Oh, if there was only someone to hear your case, but, you know, why don't you come? And he's trying to draw people to himself. How does he do it? Well, he's subtly at first speaking evil of dignitaries. And we have to be careful of that, guys. It, it, one of the signs that someone is a wolf, that someone is a, and I, I've, I've seen this a, a, couple, a few different times in the years of ministry, that a wolf comes in and one of the main marks of the wolf is they start talking bad about the leadership. And, 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 and I'm not talking, we, this is a pretty good church. It's not perfect. It's, it's definitely not perfect. I don't think there is a perfect church, but it's not a perfect church. But you start to encounter people and they start to, whenever any form of leadership comes up, they start talking bad about them. And I have to be honest with you, red flags just start going off in my mind whenever someone starts talking bad about leadership, especially at our church. Because as faulty as our church is, the leadership, they do have really good intentions. They're humans. They make mistakes, but they do have good intentions. And they, they do desire for God to be glorified and for his will to be done here on earth. And I could almost understand it at some places where church is almost not a good description of what actually happens there. It's just a dead place and practically nobody's a Christian. Um, but even there, if, if, if you can't 
if you can't sit in the teaching, if you can't go there without speaking bad about the leadership, you should probably go somewhere where you can go there without speaking bad about the leadership. But these people, false teachers, they creep in and they love to speak poorly, evil of dignitaries, people in leadership, and they reject authority. They reject other people's authority um, because they want to draw you to themselves. And these things, they corrupt themselves. Verse 11, woe to them for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So three, uh, those three, we're going to look at those next week or the next three weeks, um, depending on what God decides. Um, so we're going to move on. We're just going to keep kind of going verse by verse through the book and uh, we'll look at those three next week. So <clears throat> these are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear. So in this next little section right here, um, Jude's going to give five epithets to describe these people. Um, he calls them, firstly, these are spots in your love feast. You guys, I think you probably know that the early church would have, when they would have their communion time, they called them love feasts. Um, and it actually got to a point in some of the places where it was almost, um, what they called them almost became a stumbling block because some of the heathen people were like, wait, you guys get together and you, you all, like they actually thought there was something untoward going on because of the name of it, um, but they, they, and in Corinth in particular, they were getting out of control. The people were, it, they were becoming parties. Like they would get together for communion in like houses. And, and what started out innocently in the sense like, yeah, this is, let's do this all the time. Let's get together. Let's have a good time. Let's break bread. Let's have communion. Let's take communion and we'll have a dinner and we'll, we'll just rejoice in the Lord. Um, people started getting drunk. People started getting really drunk. People started being selfish at the Lord's table and eating before everybody came. And, and so Paul rebuked them for that, but they called them love feasts. It became widely, um, it became very common in the first century for the, the early church to call their, their time of communion, which was at a household and they were actually eating a meal, a love feast. These are spots. This is interestingly enough, I, I can't confirm that I, I can't say I confirmed this, but this word for spot is, it's the Greek word spilos. Spilos is how it's pronounced in the Greek, but it's literally means a stain. And I, I, I don't know, as I was studying, I didn't get the chance to confirm this, but it, it's possible that it's where we get our word spill from um, because there's an interesting correlation to it, but it's the idea of there being a stain um, actually, the literal word comes from a spot. It's the idea of a patch reef, which is really odd, but it's a very specific word. And it's the idea that out in the sea, you would come across, you would have all this sand bottom. And then out of nowhere, there would be one spot of rock, one spot of coral. That's the basis of the word. But it came to mean like a stain, like there was a stain on the sheet or a stain on the table. Um, so these are stains in your love feasts. And why this is important, this concept that he's saying here is important, is because you need to remember, I need to remember, that when we get together for church, when we get together um, in fellowship, when we get together to take communion, we are not doing it for ourselves. We are doing it to be ultimately, primarily to be pleasing to the Lord. And what he's saying here, this idea of them being, these people being stains in your love feast, he's, I believe strongly that he's talking about from God's perspective. God's looking down at the things that we do. And he's, look, and he's looking at these, this church with these false teachers that have crept in with all kinds of, practically every vile heresy you could imagine was apparently being blowing through the church because of people that had crept in unnoticed. And from God's perspective, these people were stains in their feast. There's something that was, that was vile to him that was, that was there. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear. Interesting. Some people we need to maybe, maybe they should fear. Serving only themselves. So the, the spots in the love feast, this first epithet, the idea here is that there was fellowship. Um, there was this kind of unrestricted fellowship. And we see this in churches today. And, and, it, and if I can just say it this way, it boils down to... Um, uh, philosophy of ministry. And when I was a youth pastor for all those years, um, I, 
I personally believe there are two philosophies of ministry. There's the philosophy of ministry that says, get as many people in the door as you possibly can, water down the word, teach short sermons, show lots of videos, have lots of games, don't correct people, don't give kids a hard time, don't ever pull them aside and say, hey, you're, you're hanging on your girlfriend too much. Just fill the building with people so that maybe they'll hear um, the gospel and, and, and whatever. And there's, there is a place for that. If I'm really honest with you, I used to be hardline the other side which I'll explain in a second. It was like, oh no, there's no place for that. There is a place for casting the net. Jesus said, Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven being like a dragnet. And so there is a, there is a time and a place for, their, for the, the sort of seeker-friendly environment to happen. I do believe that. But we do not forego um, the, other, the other part of it where people who are sinning should maybe have the fear of God put in them. And I don't mean that you take them out back with like a, billy club or something like that i mean that you actually tell them the truth we are supposed to cast the dragnet out but we we are not to do it to the to the point though to the exclusion of telling people the truth and there is this interesting thing jesus did both didn't he in the gospels right after he fed the five thousand he had the largest crowd he ever had following him at that point he feeds all of these people he's casting the dragnet out he's getting the word out what do they do though he goes over to capernaum they follow him and then in john 6 he says all those crazy things i don't mean sorry i probably shouldn't say crazy to them they seem crazy and they kind of almost seem crazy to me but i'm the one that's crazy but he says all those things about eating his flesh and drinking his blood and you guys know the passage and it says from that point on Many of his disciples left him and didn't follow him anymore. And it seems only the 12 and maybe some other people followed him from this point on. But Jesus wasn't like, he didn't run after the multitudes, the thousands of people as they left and say, oh, please keep following me. I'm sorry if what I said was too harsh. No, he had this, he had a huge group of insincere people following him. And he, and he decided at that point to speak some really heavy hard to hear truths that thinned out all of the people who were insincere, which was most of them. And so Jesus did both. If you're following me, I used to be to the side where it's like, oh no, the philosophy of ministry is you tell people the truth, you make the youth group this super safe place where, where there's just, um, you know, you, you don't put up with anything, you correct people all the time. And, and I, I don't necessarily think that it has to be one or the other. I think both can happen. I think that's good. You do cast the dragnet out, but not to the exclusion of telling people the truth. And Jesus apparently would rather have 12 sincere people than thousands of insincere people following him, at least in that sense. Who knows how many of those people later came to faith after his resurrection? Probably a lot of them. Um, but at that point, many of them stopped following him. These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you without fear. It is important at some, some points to instill the fear of God in people through telling them the truth. They serve only themselves. They are clouds without water. So the second epithet here, they are clouds without water carried about by the winds. This idea that, that it's like clouds without water, that these people looked the part on the outside, but they brought absolutely no refreshment um, from their lives, nothing. And there's also the connotation here that the clouds are driven by the wind, that these people were un they, they weren't stable within themselves. They, there was no steadfastness to them. They're just like a cloud that's driven about and changes form and, and doesn't have anything refreshing coming out of them. Carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Now, I'm going to be really clear. This is strongly my opinion. I don't, I'm not totally sure what to make of his comment here. <clears throat> late autumn trees without fruit well almost no trees fruit in autumn so he he's not making a contrast here like they're spring late spring trees without fruit now that would be odd um late autumn trees this idea that they these these trees um late autumn maybe the leaves are changing color there's a possibility that he's kind of saying they look good like the trees are the leaves are changing though that typically happens in early autumn um I'm not totally sure what he means by the late autumn thing, but I will say this, um, the without fruit is very pertinent. The idea that these people don't have fruit. It's basically the same idea of the clouds without water. The twice dead thing though is a little tricky. 
We know that their people are born dead, right? And so that's very biblical. Um, people are born dead in the sense that they're born separated from God. But he says here these people are twice dead. Well, if they're alive, they're not twice dead in the typical biblical sense, if you're following me. Because the typical biblical sense is that um, the second death is, is actually being cast into hell. So when he says here that they're twice dead, uh, it's a little tricky. I'm, I'm actually not totally sure what he means. It's possible that he means that these people are apostate and apostate in the sense that they are dead. Not only are they born separated from God, but they, are, they have committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit already and that they are already twice dead. I don't know. I'm not really totally sure. Um, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea. So this is uh, the fourth epithet there, um, raging waves of the sea foaming up their own shame. So basically the idea here, if you've ever seen raging waves, you know, like the idea of waves in a storm and how there's rising and falling. The idea though is the abundance of the foam, I believe, that there's the, this shame coming out of them. I don't know how many of you people know that, but a very, very, very prominent Christian Another very prominent Christian this week um, came out and admitted because of a ton of accusations of sexual impropriety um, that there's uh, more than a little truth to all of the accusations. And this idea that it's just like, it got me, this is, I was thinking about this because there's so much abundant shame in this person's life. It was just oh, absolutely incredible. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Um, this is interesting because stars don't really wander. Stars travel in a direction. They're, they're like on a course. I think most, if not all of them are moving, but they don't really wander. And so it's odd that they're wandering. But this idea that these stars are, he, the picture I believe he's creating is that this star is out there in space alone, wandering for eternity. The idea, again, he's very hellfire and brimstone here. Yeah, we'll end there for this week. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truths we've considered tonight. Uh, I ask that you would bless, bless your word, the parts of it that were you, Lord, that you would sink it deep down into our hearts, Lord, and that would it affect that change in us, that it would bring about um, the full measure of the stature of Christ in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.